Well, hey folks, uh, my name is Josh Johnson. I was asked by a fur, fur fin and feather group out of the Twin Cities uh, club that meets out there to share a little bit about um, Fort Peck and Sakakawea and uh, some of the species that I target and some of my favorite ways to do that. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, just a little background on myself. Um, I grew up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, fishing a lot of largemouth, uh, panfish, and uh, smallmouth in rivers. I ended up going to college at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I uh, got a degree in fisheries management. Um, interned with the Minnesota DNR out of Brainerd and uh, Walker for a few years. Um, everywhere I went, I fished the whole way, whether it was uh, muskies and smallmouth in the Wisconsin River, lakes all over you know, Brainerd, Walker Park Rapids, neck of the woods. Um, my whole life I've loved fishing. Um, done it everywhere I go, uh, whether I'm fishing or studying fish, that's pretty much what I do. Um, so anyways, long story short, I uh, came out to Williston, North Dakota to get a job for the winter uh, in between my, you know, when my summer internship ended after college. Uh, one thing led to another. Got a good setup out here in Wilson, North Dakota, and the area is really growing on me as well as the fishing, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today, um, which is Fort Peck and Sakakawea. Where I'm at in Williston, right here on the west end of Sakakawea, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right on the west end of Sakakawea. I'm a couple hours from Fort Peck, um, and I love, love them both. Most of my background growing up was on natural lakes and on small to mid-sized rivers. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really um, approaches and methods and, and concepts to take to heart, uh, especially for people that might be visiting um, from out of state uh, that are more used to natural lakes, etc., and may not quite um, be as familiar with some of the quirks of reservoir fishing. And both Fort Peck and Sakakawea, they're both reservoirs on the Missouri River system. Uh, both are awesome multi-species fisheries. Both reservoirs and the river connect to them. Uh, whether you're looking for, you know, giant walleye, numbers of walleye, giant pike, uh, in some cases numbers of pike, smallmouth bass, uh, lake trout, salmon, I mean white bass, crappie, I mean everything, <laughs> paddlefish, gar, I mean even giant rainbow trout, um, it's amazing. I mean some of the tailwater fishing, river fishing, and uh, just how dynamic these fisheries are, being that they're kind of like a two-story fishery. They're, they're ginormous fisheries. Um, I believe Sakakawea is the fourth largest reservoir in the U.S., and Fort Peck is the fifth largest. Um, I think I've heard it said that they both have as much or more shoreline than the entire coast of California. Uh, but anyways, these fisheries, uh, kind of what drives them is they're big, but they have massive amounts of shallow awesome structure as well as deep water which um, really supports awesome cold water bait fish. On Fort Peck, Cisco is really the king of what drives the the giant fish out there whether it be catfish, lake trout, walleye, pike, everything smallmouth eats the Cisco. Um, on Sakakawea there's also Cisco Lots of them, they tend to be a little bit bigger, and the small to mid-sized bait tends to be smelt. Also, there's tons and tons and tons of emerald shiners all throughout the lake. Um, there's all sorts of bait and multiple options for fish to chow down besides that, but that's some of the key bait sources in these systems that um, really drive these epic fisheries. So I mentioned I grew up fishing a lot of natural lakes and small to mid-sized rivers. Um, I've been out here now for coming up on 10 years actually and uh, there's definitely quite a few quirks to reservoir fishing um, you know that kind of caught me off guard at times and uh, part of what I'm going to try to get across to you guys today isn't always like specific techniques or specific spots or specifics but general concepts that you can apply that can really you know give you the help you have a big picture you know kind of mindset when you're coming out. So you can take in as many factors as you can, draw that down to maximize your efficiency on the water to really capitalize on some of these epic epic bites out here because I'll tell you this, it can be incredibly, incredibly tough at times. Um, even when the fishing is good, um, for every story you hear of like epic, epic fishing, there's very good anglers out there that could have a day where they struggle. Um, it's an incredibly dynamic fishery. Um, 
um, water levels are fluctuating, water clarity, the bait fish, I mean, their lives revolve around eating. <laughs> when the bait moves, you know, we, we don't have control of that, you gotta you got be following the bait, following the fish. Um, just to have perspective, like, it can be as good as it gets, but it can also be incredibly tough. And, you know, you put in your time and, like, you stick with it, eventually, um, it'll usually come together if you keep moving, keep trying, keep working at it, put that pattern together, and you can have some of the craziest fishing ever, you know, pretty often, actually. Okay, now, before I get started on some of the big concepts to apply uh, when it comes to reservoir fishing, a couple important things to keep in mind, especially if you're coming from out of state and you're not, not really familiar, uh, both these lakes are pretty remote compared to a lot of places in the country, uh, especially Fort Peck. Um, for example, when it comes to Fort Peck, um, if you want to drive a paved road all the way to the boat launch, you literally only have two options up by the dam. That's it. The rest of like 60 some, 80, 70, 80 miles, I don't even know, length of the lake, there is zero options to drive a paved road all the way to the boat launch. In fact, some of the dirt roads you'd have to take to the boat launch are like, you know, 30 to 60 miles. <laughs> It can def you definitely have to work for it, but I'll tell you, it can definitely be, be worth your time. Um, you know, honestly, drive slow, it's not really a problem um, on the dirt roads. Uh, in terms of uh, places to stay on Fort Peck, there are free camping options at most of the boat launches. Um, and some of them are really quite nice, you know, remote, awesome camping options. The big thing to keep in mind is there isn't electricity at a lot of them. Personally, for me, I got a Honda generator. It has been like my best friend out there. That thing is awesome. Um, with that, I mean, <laughs> you're set. So uh, you don't need electricity. Um, if you're looking for a little bit more of a place to stay at Fort Peck, the town of Fort Peck, Glasgow, um, there's uh, some lodging options up by the dam, and there's some options at Rock Creek in the dry arm and Hell Creek, right in the kind of middle of the lake. Um, but even, you know, Rock Creek, you got to drive a little dirt road. Hell Creek, there's like a 25, 30 mile dirt road. Um, so either way, you got to put in some work. But like I said, it is it is worth the effort. Um, Sakakui, on the other hand, uh, definitely a little remote compared to some places. But there's quite a few more accesses. Lots of paved roads all the way to the accesses. Uh, there's quite a few options for hotels, uh, campgrounds, you know, little resort cabins um, from the west end of the east end all over. Um, keep in mind on both lakes, uh, there's cell phone service throughout the areas, but if you get in canyon sections, you will not have service, um, particularly Fort Peck. I mean, most of the west half of the lake, you're almost zero cell phone service. Sakakui is spotty, um, but just keep that in mind in terms of safety. It is big water. If the winds get over 15 mile an hour, I mean, it starts getting a little rough out there, um, you know, and uh, yeah, um, it's just important that, you know, keep in mind safety, be prepared, um, a little extra food, extra water, maybe a spare bilge pump that you keep in like a, a dry bag that, you know, if some freak situation happens, you can hook up to your batteries and utilize as a spare bilge, you know, flares you can light off, uh, just be prepared, you know, with extra supplies. Just to be smart out there because, you know, it is a little bit remote. It's, a, it's an adventure. It's awesome. Um, so, yeah, just a couple things to keep in mind, and now we'll get on to the fishing aspect. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some concepts here that can really help you cut down on the learning curve, um, hopefully to maximize your time on the water. Uh, number one, if you really want to cut down on the learning curve, hire a guide. I'm sure there's lots and lots of good ones. Um, personally, I do guided trips on Sakakawea. And hopefully soon on Fort Peck, there's a few more hoops to jump through, but I'm hoping to get that lined out here soon. Um, first off, if you're not hiring a guide, or I mean, even if you're hiring a guide, uh, but the first most important thing, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, is do your homework and do as much as you can before you get to the lake. Um, you don't just show up at a random boat launch and decide to fish one day. You do lots of study ahead of time to really maximize your game so that you're ready when you get out there. First off, get yourself Lake Master Maps of the lake. Uh, the Lake Master Mapping is phenomenal, um, particularly under like 30 foot of water. Um, deeper than that, for the most part, uh, it's worthless. 
<laughs> but under 30 foot, if you're fishing under 30 foot, it's it's mostly phenomenal. Uh, Navionics um, has much of Sakakawea and this half of Fort Peck mapped. And much of Navionics is pretty good out deep. Um, so, unfortunately, you kind of really need both map map chips uh, to to really be successful um, if you're fishing both shallow and deep. Now, keep in mind if you're coming from uh, more of a natural lake sort of background, these water levels can fluctuate quite a bit year to year. Um, so it's important that if you're studying the maps, they actually have the correct water levels to study. Um, to do that, all you need is just grab your phone. Um, first off, I uh, would highly recommend downloading the Fish Smart Hummingbird app, um, buying the map for whatever lake you choose, um, and uh, using that to study. Uh, using the Fish Smart app on the phone, it's convenient, it's awesome. Um, so, first, uh, now what you can do to figure out water levels, I mean, this is a basic thing a lot of people are probably familiar with, but I'll just share it here quick. So go to Google, uh, you can type in Sakakawea full pool elevation to figure out what the full pool elevation is. The same thing would apply to Fort Peck. So full pool on Sakakawea is 1,850 feet. So now we're gonna go to the USGS site. And uh, Sakakawea on the USGS site is referred to as the Garrison Dam. But uh, yeah, just searching USGS Garrison Dam Daily Bulletin, clicking the link, clicking the Daily River Bulletin. If you zoom in here, you can see Fort Pex on there and Garrison Dam, also on you know, Sakakawea. Uh, we're going to go check the current gauge reading. And we subtract the full pool from the current gauge and that's how we know to adjust our water levels so here we go I'm on my fish smart app I'm gonna check mark Sakakawea and uh, go to the chart view clicking through here the app uh, currently I was uh, mo most recently I was looking at Fort Peck so I'm gonna zoom over to Sakakawea Zoom on in here, and you can see the beautiful Lake Master contours set for the water level that I currently have it at. Um, I'll go up to the toolbar here, and you can see if we go down to water level offset, it was on negative two, but the lake is 15 foot lower than the full pool elevation, so I'm setting it to negative 15, and you can see how it changes the map for you. You can see this particular bay, Whitetail Bay, also known as Lund's Landing. Not a lot of water in it right now. Lots of mud back there. So anyways, that's a very important tool <laughs> so that you're not studying the incorrect depths the whole time before you get out here. Um, number two, when it comes to uh, studying ahead of time, something that's really, really cool that I never really considered a whole lot back when I fished natural lakes is you can utilize Google Earth. Um, and looking at Google Earth, you can get, I mean, just satellite imagery in general, you can get big picture concepts of what's going on. I mean, even just looking, you can't see, you know, because of the, you're far enough away on the map, but even just like a big picture perspective of Fort Peck, I can see like some of these like really rocky looking areas along certain shorelines. Like even just looking at the satellite imagery, it looks really rocky in this area of the lake and in this area of the lake. Up by the dam, it looks awfully green. I mean, this is just me staring at it from like a long ways away. So if I'm interested in fishing smallies, I'm probably going to gravitate towards some of the rockier sections. If you fine tune that, you can look even just on the shorelines and see like, hey, is there lots of rock on the shore? Because if there is, there might be rock sticking out into the lake. If you don't want rock, you look for areas that don't have rock. I mean, but it's just, you know, start big and start, you know, zoom, you know fine tuning piece by piece. Um, additionally, a really awesome tool is if you use Google Earth from your computer, you can find historical satellite imagery, and both of these lakes, they fluctuate in water levels enough that sometimes you can find, you know, images of the lake when they were, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 35 foot lower than they, they might currently be. That is a huge, huge tool. I've spent 
tons and tons and tons and tons of time studying these lakes as much as possible with satellite imagery. I've I've physically been in many of these. Uh, I mean, I've, I've crisscrossed these lakes multiple times and been through tons of these bays. But I'll tell you, the amount of time and energy it takes to do that compared to like sifting through satellite imagery, there's no comparison. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how to do that. It's an awesome tool. It'll save you some time. Let you figure it out on your own. There's lots of lots of resources if you just Google it to figure out how to do that stuff. Okay, so number two, uh, which is along the lines of doing homework also, uh, a very important concept to keep in mind, is understanding as much as you can about what you're fishing for and what they're eating. Um, <clears throat> it's important to understand that these reservoirs from one end to the next can be very different. Both of these, the Missouri River enters on the west end, and on the west end, I mean, uh, it's going to be much shallower, warmer, um, off-color water where down by the dam you're going to have deep, cold, clear water. Uh, if you're a salmon or a lake trout, you're going to tend to gravitate towards that cold, deep, clear water because that's more your style. It's your habitat. That's your, you know, that's your niche. Uh, if you're a smallmouth bass, you may not want to live in 200 foot of water at the dam. Um, you may prefer to be closer to a little bit warmer water, but still have good access to, you know, some of that cold water bait fish. Uh, it's important to keep in mind with most, like with every fish on, on the on these systems, um, it's very important to keep in mind like with the smelt and cisco, they tend to hang out in the deeper, colder, clear water. Not everything you're fishing for wants to necessarily suspend in 120 foot of water. Um, but if you can find that collision of where your preferred, you know, game fish is habitat comes in very close contact to like, you know, that offshore bait, that can be the money spot. So let's just say you're a northern pike you, in the middle of the summer, you might like an extended point that has a good weed bed shallow, nice rocky point extending out and plummets off into like 80 foot of water. Um, you have really good access to Cisco, you know, or, you know, if you want to like go back up into the weed bed, just cause pike like, you know, vegetation, they can munch on perch, hang out in the weeds, and move back and forth very quickly and very easily. Uh, it's a it's a good pivot point where they can access deep water very quickly, but they also have the shallows. Um, I actually have heard Jason Mitchell, you know, um, actually talk about you know areas on these reservoirs where the fish want a room with a view, and that's I mean I agree 100%. Um, many of the really really good spots, particularly you know particularly midsummer and midfall, you look for habitat that fish would typically you know love and look for uh, where that intersects with deep channel swings and deep drops. So if you're a smallmouth and you want a you know, mid-depth rocky hump, look for that mid-depth rocky hump that drops off into the river channel. You got a you know, beautiful home on that rocky hump. You also have access to like massive amounts of cisco or smelt, just you know, hop, skip it and jump away. You know? And not to mention that school of bait will just go swim right over that hump on accident once in a while and get pounded. Something else I'd highly recommend when it comes to understanding the bait that I do a lot. Um, if you're coming into an area that you're expecting to potentially find uh, the game fish you're chasing, I really like to stop a ways from the spot you're about to fish and just graph over that deep water. Get a, get a real good feel of like what's out there. Where are the bait fish at in the water column? What do they look like? Um, is there bait fish in the channel by your spot? Is there bait fish over your spot? What do they look like? And then how do the fish bite, you know, once you're fishing your spot? Uh, what I found in time too, um, a lot of times you can recognize patterns of what the bait is doing and if that might be a worthwhile spot to fish. Uh, generally speaking, if I'm coming into a spot and I see a lot of like tightly grouped smaller balls of bait, you know, here and there and all over the place, that is a really, really, really good sign because they're being chased and they're getting, like, the tighter that bait ball, uh, the better the spot might be. A lot of times if you come into a spot, especially in the early mornings or late evenings, uh, you know, some of the bait fish, they tend to, you know, kind of like almost spread out. And if you, if you see them spread out, like one here, one there, one here, one there, and not tightly grouped in a, in a group of bait, a lot of times just because they're not getting chased, uh, might not be worth your time fishing there. So over time, uh, pay attention to like, what the bait is doing and actually just in general like covering miles of lake and seeing like what areas of the lake have massive concentrations of bait and also something to keep in mind um 
generally speaking, you play the wind, uh, especially walleye fishing on Sakakawea. I mean, play the wind. I mean, it, it, the wind is your friend. Fish the windy end of the lake. It might not always be the most fun, but it's going to, you know, agitate the bait, push them up shallow, activate the fish. Play the wind. I mean, that's a common concept, but play the wind. Um, an important concept to keep in mind, uh, if you're not as familiar with fishing uh, some of these deep reservoirs with cold water bait fish, uh, these cold water bait fish, they're just filled with fat, they grow big fish. But these cold water bait fish need cold water. Um, if it's July um, and you're in 20 foot of water on the west end of the reservoir in muddy water, the Cisco are not really going to survive there. Um, for the most part, you need 60 foot or deeper, you know, for the most part to really, you know, maintain bigger populations of like Cisco and smelts, etc. So uh, just keep in mind um, in the winter, etc., I mean, you can have. I mean, the west ends of these lakes get massive pushes of cisco and smelt in the winter and, and during the spawning seasons. But, uh, you know, once the lakes start warming up, you get uh, runoff hitting the lakes, they muddy up. Uh, those populations of, like, cold water bait are going to move down the lake. Um, and you're really going to want to be seeing at least probably 60 or 80 foot of, you know, at least 60 foot of water and be graphing over that channel, see like, hey, is there a lot of Cisco out here? If there isn't, maybe I don't want to be fishing this area of the lake. Is there a lot of smelt out here? If there isn't, maybe I don't want to be fishing this area of the lake. So keep that in mind. Be adjacent to big schools of bait. So the last main concept I want to get across to you guys um, that's of utmost importance to really capitalize and have awesome days of fishing out here more often than not deals with efficiency and patterns. Um, so for example, efficiency, just, you know, keep this in mind. Uh, let's just say you're trolling for walleye and you can get them going one mile an hour. You know, that's cool. You're catching fish, but let's just say you can crank up that same speed and get them to trigger going two miles an hour. Well, if you're going two miles an hour instead of one mile an hour, you're going to cover twice as much water. Uh, it might sound kind of basic and silly, but I mean, it's, it's very important. The more water you can cover, the more efficient you can be, the more fish you're going to contact and run into. Um, it's so important to pay attention to where the fish are, why they were there, and then you can look at the map, look at satellite imagery, etc., to find similar situations where you can apply the same concept. And that's where you can turn a pretty good day into a crazy good day in a hurry. Um, let's just say, you know, it's springtime and I'm catching smallies in the back half of large bays. Well, I might notice hey, you know, the I crushed them on areas where there was in timber, but it wasn't just timber, it was timber that had little bits of rock mixed into it. So you can look and just run down the bank, you know, like just driving as fast as you can through the bay, and you can literally see stumps sticking out of the water, and if you see a gravelly bank, you fish it. If it looks like pure mud, I just keep driving. Um, so you can burn a lot of gas doing that, but um, at the same point, you don't want to hit everything. Once you start developing a pattern and you fine tune it, you focus in, you run that as fast as you possibly can. However, keeping in mind at any point conditions can change. <clears throat> Let's just say it's sunny out and you're running a specific pattern and all of a sudden it's like cloudy and there's a front moving in, the fish might change, you might need to adjust. Um, also keep in mind, you know, as you move through the lake, you might be running a really, really solid pattern, but uh, you know, Let's just say you're in Fort Peck here and, and you're running a solid pattern in here and then you get out here, this narrows area in here might be much dirtier and then you go this way, it starts clearing up. Your pattern might start to change depending on which area of the lake you're moving into. However, the awesome thing with these lakes is there is so much structure, there is so much water out there um, that if you can develop a pattern, it is unbelievable because you can hit so many spots. On these reservoirs, I can't emphasize enough, you cannot fish everything. like. I don't fish a whole point. I'll fish a very, very specific spot on that point once I develop a pattern. So I'll cover, I don't necessarily cover the whole point. I might cover 30 points in a day, um, hitting very, very small areas where I feel like the highest percentage spots are. Once again, it's developing a pattern so that you can be as efficient as possible on the lake. And that's really, I mean, how you can turn, you know, okay or good days into really good days is sticking with it 
uh, persisting and just running hard. I mean, it's, honestly, you can burn a lot of gas at times, but um, in the end, it can pay off with, you know, some really awesome fishing. Also, and to keep in mind, I mean, it might take six hours before you really start developing a pattern. And the next two, three hours of fishing might just be fire. Um, it can take a while to really develop that pattern, but if you stick with it, it's going to happen. So, yeah, that's the final concept. Okay, so I'm on to the second half of uh, this little presentation here. I'm going to go over uh, some, some lures, techniques, and seasons uh, that tend to be some of my favorite options to target fish on Sakakui and Fort Peck. To start with, um, kind of a multi-species appro approach um, I think is really overlooked on Sakakui is fishing bays and specifically the back halves of the bays and uh, often as far back into the bays you can pretty much go um, you know two three four or five foot of water um, uh, it's a it's a pattern that works pretty much once it warms up in the spring um, you know especially once you know end of May or June starts rolling around um, all the way through the summer and even you know a lot of times in October what I like to look for is uh, balls of small emerald shiners and a lot of times if you're like, especially on a calm day looking out, you'll see little bits of flickering on the surface um, where these little balls of emerald shiners are at. But really I'm just going to the back halves of these bays looking for cover, uh, like little bits of weeds, little bits of wood, um, you know, like an irrigation pipe, things like that. And the emerald shiners will hang around that, that structure, cover, etc. And it's amazing the fish that are back there, including, uh, you know, you'd be surprised at the giant walleyes back there sometimes. Uh, a couple of my go-tos um, for targeting fish in those areas. And keep in mind, this is like a really cool multi-species approach. It's awesome at times for white bass, uh, walleye, pike, and smallmouth in particular. Those are the main ones that come to mind, but yeah, I mean, you can catch a drum and everything else in the meantime as well. Um... Number one is actually, well, I'll start here. This is a Scottsboro Tackle Phantom Underspin. You can see this flashy little willow leaf blade here, a little quarter ounce. And I'll run like a three inch or four inch gulp minnow on it and cast it out and retrieve it back in. Um, I also like jigging these out deeper, but anyways, that can be a really good option. This little blade, um, something when you're in those little emerald shiners, I mean, the little underspins just really stand out um, and mimic that, you know, kind of a little school of shiners really well. Another thing, um, the Swart Zonker McRubber grub tail. I mean, grub tails catch fish, period. Um, I really, I'm, I'm not usually huge on colors, but honestly, this uh, blue and silver glitter color, I mean, particularly with those shiners, I think is actually, you know, kind of a key item. And uh, basic jig and grub can slaughter fish. Uh, all year long, and particularly when you're around those balls of emerald shiners in the back bays. Um, additionally, something I like to use just as like a reaction bait, which really can get bit very well, particularly from big walleye at times, is lipless cranks. Um, this is a Strike King Red Eye Shad. It works really well in shallow. It also works well jigging in, in the mid-depths, um, but casting and retrieving these in that two, three, four foot of water in your back bays, particularly around these balls, emerald shiners, can get bit by all sorts of different fish. Um, and this, you know, it's surprising, some of the giant walleye you'll pick up on lipless cranks in like two, three, four foot of water in the back bays. Um, also, year-round, just, I mean, as a general rule, lipless cranks, I think, are one of the more underrated things for walleye in a lake, period. Um, whether it's Jigging them in the spring or casting and cranking them in the summer and fall or it they work very well. Also, I'm not a huge, huge like you know, stickler on colors. Day in, day out, it's hard to go wrong with some variation of white and some some variation of chrome blue on Sakakui and Fort Peck. Um, so those are kind of my standard go-tos. So um that's kind of a first little tip is uh <clears throat> you know, just some tips for catching all sorts of fish and a really good multi-species approach for fishing these back bay areas, uh, which can be surprisingly good and I think surprisingly overlooked on the lake. And if you're struggling on a lot of like, you know, stereotypical main lake structure, stuff like that, a lot of times if you just need to mix it up, go way back into a bay, have some fun, catch all sorts of fish, everything from white bass, big walleye, smallmouth, crappie, um, and ha have a blast. It's really a fun, fun time, really overlooked uh, method of fishing on the lake at times.
Um, so, additionally for kind of a multi-species approach, it's really just kind of a really standard walleye technique on the lake is uh, slow death rigs. This happens to be a Mustad, you know, slow death style hook. Honestly, it's not, you don't even have to have the slow death hook. The important thing is to have your crawler. The main thing with a slow death hook, hook it, it makes your worm like a swimming worm coming through the water. Um, just like pulling a Lindy, pulling a bottom bouncer. Um, but you have the worm kind of hang off the bend of the, sh the bend in the hook so you get ni nice little curl as the worm goes through the water. Um, <clears throat> but in general, um, when it comes to like walleye, but also like in terms of multi-species approach, slow death rigs just get bit period and they get bit by everything and they, and they catch lots and lots and lots of walleye. Sometimes some big ones also. Um, I wouldn't say it's my best big fish approach for walleye, but in terms of just getting bit and getting your feel for reservoir fishing, it's a super awesome technique and you catch everything that swims in the lake. Um, one little tip, um, I like using these quick swap sinkers, you know, with like my bottom bouncer style, like slow death rigging. Um, this here will slide up and down your line just like a, like a slip sinker, but you can see this, this is a, a one ounce weight and this is a quarter ounce weight. And then let's just say I'm fishing 12, 15 foot of water with an ouncer. I move up real shallow and I want to like get that slow death rig a long ways behind the boat to, to spook fish, to, to not spook fish if I get up in like, you know, four or five foot of water, which is pretty common in the spring. You can just quickly, you know, pop that out, pop this in, and you have your sinker set up, your sinker set up ready to go. Uh, just helps you be real efficient, cover a lot of different depths on the lake. Um, so <clears throat> when I'm targeting fish with slow death rigs, uh, one of my favorite times of the year, I mean, really once the water gets over about 50 degrees, but particularly June through the first part of July, you can catch the snot out of walleye along with everything else that swims on a slow death rig. A lot of times, during that time of the year, I'm fishing this area of the lake. Um, the water can be, and I'm referring to Sakakui at the moment, um, the water can be pretty off color. Uh, if it's really off color, I like to run 1.5 uh, Max Smile Blade. It's a little paper blade. It spins very easily at slow speeds, puts off a lot of extra vibration. I'll run a bead in front of this, um, you know, to the slow death rig you know, swimming behind it through the water. Um, in the dirty water, these pay off really, really well. In clear water, sometimes they can too. Um, it's good to experiment. If you're fishing dirty water one day, you're probably gonna air this direction. In clear water, you might lose the lose the spinner. Um, just try a plane. So, yeah, like I said, uh, the west end of the lake, being that it warms up first in the spring, you get those big pushes of spawning walleye up the river in the spring, and as there were you know, some of the big populations are starting to work their way east. Like I said, in June and in early July, I mean, it's just, it can be awesome, fun time fishing right in this area. That's where I love to do a lot of fishing, you know, throughout the month of June. And so, um, another technique that I really like doing in June, which is really one of my favorite months to fish walleye, is casting cranks. My uh, go-to crank is a Rapala glass shad wrap, which, in off-color water, you think it wouldn't be as solid of an option as potentially some flashier options, but they eat this thing even in like completely muddy water. Um, the glass shad wrap is meant to kind of like suspend a little bit more. It doesn't rise as quickly out of the strike zone. Uh, in the warm water, it will rise, but uh, it doesn't rise as quickly out of the strike zone. And in the dirty water, um, I'll cast it and I'll crawl it along pretty slow with like a pause, pull, pause, and pull. Um, you know a lot of start, starting and stopping and getting this thing near the bottom. And I think they just, that you know, there's that little bit of rattle in there um, and then they come in and track it down. But it's not like, you know, floating up out of the strike zone real quick and I'm not moving it like ultra fast. And these cranks can really clean up on the fish. I love casting these things kind of those shallow to mid depth ranges, you know, from late May to mid July. Um, if the water, if you're in areas of the lake where the water does clear up, um, I like cranking these things pretty fast and erratically, you know, with some twitches and yanking it, um, you know, kind of, they call it janking, jerkbait cranking, you know, uh, you know, really twitch twitching it, cranking it fast. 
and getting a little bit more erratic with it when the water clears up. Um, my favorite areas to cast cranks in particular is this whole stretch of water here from Newtown all the way down to Van Hook. There's piles and piles and piles of little like rocky points and stuff. And um, you know, pretty much I'll play the wind, uh, cast points that are in the wind and run them you know, down the lake. You can start getting a feel for like what depths are productive, what kind of, you know, points seem to be looking the best, get that pattern together, and you can really have a heyday with cranks. Um, one of my favorite ways to catch walleye out here. And uh, something else, a uh, very important thing to keep in mind, um, can, to an extent it's any big water system, but I think especially some of these reservoirs that have some natural current on their own, um, when the wind gets howling, it really can build current, especially when it's going the same direction as the current. Uh, if the current's flowing this way and the wind's going this way, that current really gets going strong. At the same point, it's surprising if the wind is, is really cranking the other way, it can get a current going the other direction too. And the thing to keep in mind, especially in these narrow stretches of the lake or anywhere, um, that current can really position the fish, which can be super advantageous to capitalizing on the bites. Generally speaking, <clears throat> when it's calmer and sunnier, and I see this a lot for walleye and smallmouth in particular, I think the fish tend to spread out and they don't position as predictably. When the wind is really howling, they can position in really predictable ways. Um, in particular, let's just say you have a point and the wind and you know the current is just ripping, you know, across that point. Uh, a lot of times they'll position, like let's just say you have a point and then you have a big old rock pile on this side of the point and the wind's coming in this way. They'll sit specifically on that rock pile on the back side of the point, out of the current, waiting for bait fish to you know come right over that point and attack them. Um, at times they will position on the leading edge of the point. I would say more often I'm catching them in the kind of the downstream, you know, uh, slack water area on that point, waiting for bait fish to flush over their head. But if they're really active, I think they will move on the up current side of that point. But like I said, wind can actually really be your friend, and while it can be a little bit rough and harder to get around, more often than not it positions the fish very predictably and it's a good way to like you know almost call your shots as to where they could or should be sitting. Um, so yeah just a few little tips on one of my favorite times of the year to fish walleye on Sakakawea which is really end of May through mid-July. Um, it's an awesome shallow bite and actually something I should bring up real quick too um, both these lakes tend to rise a lot from the end of May to mid-July, <clears throat> you know, approximately due to uh, runoff from the mountains, actually. The, uh, the Yellowstone River and the Missouri River really pick these lakes up a lot. So as that water is rising, <clears throat> it really helps maintain an awesome shallow water bite, you know, right out into the middle of the summer. Um, so it's a fun, fun way to capitalize on shallow water walleye. You know, that's one of my favorite ways to get them. So anyways... On to the next species, so kind of a multi-species approach, um, you know, which works all summer and fall. Walleye approach, uh, one of my favorite, couple of my favorite ways to fish them in June. Now on to northern pike. Uh, there are giants in both lakes. I tend to fish them more on Sakakawea. It's it can be unbelievable. Uh, my favorite time of the year to fish them is spring, um, and a lot of their locations tend to um, revolve around a combination of where they spawn but ultimately where they're feeding. Um, what I like to target is post-spawn pike that are actively feeding and, it, and in my opinion it's going to revolve a lot around um, the sucker spawn, um, also white bass coming in shallow to spawn, and also cisco. Um, I think cisco spent a lot of time moving back and forth between the deep and shallows in the early time of the year and those pike once they spawn they're out to feed. So for a little while, I think they like basking in the warmth of the shallows, capitalizing on some of the shallow water bait opportunities. And while they're doing that, it can be thrilling. My favorite baits, uh, my, my number one producer beyond the shadow of a doubt is these Schwarzenegger McRover swim baits. The most thrilling way you can possibly catch them out here. It's unbelievable. Uh, the way I like to fish these, that really tends to trigger a lot of bites. And <clears throat> real quick here, kind of a Cisco or a sucker color pattern. A Cisco style color pattern, kind of my two go-tos. Um, the best way that I've found to trigger these things day in day out is really a super fast retrieve where I'll bulge the thing right along the surface. 
I think that fast retrieve triggers them into eating, even like gargantuous pike that do not need to eat. Um, and when you're bulging along the surface, it's important to remember like, you know, you might be doing a straight retrieve, but to give directional changes throughout the retrieve to help trigger strikes. Also, these things absolutely positively eat on the figure eight. And it's very important to be aware of, you know, following fish, be prepared to, you know, do a figure eight or kind of big oval boat side. And uh, a lot of times when you're coming in, you might give it a directional change in the retrieve, get them to eat shortly thereafter. Or a lot of times right by the boat, as you're starting to go into the eight, they eat right then. That's one of the most common ways I get them. It's unbelievable. You'll see a weight coming in for 60 foot chasing your swim bait in and they devour it. It's unbelievable. I mean, these things will be down the hatch. Um, absolutely incredible way to fish them. If they're a little bit, oh, also if the water's a little off color, I'm getting excited here, I need to breathe. Um, if the water's a little off color, uh, the swim baits at a high rate of speed don't work quite as well. Um, if the water gets pretty off color, a lot of times I use maybe a, you know, maybe this style pattern or like a blue, white, and pink. I actually like to use two with the McRubbers. Um, however, in the off color water, I'd say I tend to lean a little bit more towards uh, just like a little gliding jerk bait like this little phantom six inch soft tail. This thing gets bit, catches big ones, and it's an awesome presentation when the water's a little off color because um, you can work it a little bit slower but it's a still erratic and triggers them into eating and they'll they'll crush this thing so um it's awesome awesome bait out on the lake chasing pike in the spring um if they are a little bit deeper uh especially if i'm kind of fishing secondary points or weed beds you know off secondary points or eventually as they move out on the main lake uh an awesome go-to crank for me is a rapala super shad wrap and one of my favorites is the Bondi Mini Wobbler. Um, I'll either give it, you know, a rip, you know, reel up the slack and a rip and reel up the slack, or I'll just, you know, reel, reel, reel really fast and then just, you know, kill it. Like I don't rip it with the rod, only the reel, like reel, real fast and then pause. And on a tight line, when this thing pauses, this thing shimmies on the drop and they really like seeing that thing shimmy on down and they'll crush it. Um, so like I said, McRubbers are my number one go-to option in shallow. Um, in mid to deeper depths, Rapala Super Shad Wrap, and the Bondi Wobbler. And like I said, I'm just kind of covering a few basic methods that are some go-tos for me. Once the water warms up and, you know, especially post-spawn for the smallmouth, an awesome presentation on both the Cockawee and Fort Peck is top water. Um, this is, these are some Rapala Skitter Walks. This is a Whopper Plopper. Um, if the fish stays shallow for a long time on Sakakawea after the spawn, which especially helps if it's higher water, um, the whopper plopper bite can be mind-bogglingly good. Um, incredible. Uh, on both lakes, and four pack, man, it's some of the biggest smallies I've ever had of eating whopper ploppers. Um, on both lakes, day in, day out, walking top waters get absolutely obliterated. Um, this is just a generic white pattern. This is kind of a little, little frog pattern. The funny thing about both lakes, um, especially come, you know, July, like the month of July in particular, it is almost hilarious how much they key in on grasshoppers. Um, and they're sitting up really shallow in little grassy patchy area, uh, little, you know, areas of patchy grass, literally keyed in on grasshoppers. And these walking top waters, which this one kind of even happens to look like a grasshopper sort of, um, that zigzag across the surface. I think they imitate, they imitate fleeing bait really well. Like, Bait, when it flees, it really zigzags a lot of times. Um, it also happens to, to imitate a you know, grasshopper trying to get away. Um, it's pretty unreal how large a smallmouth will actively seek out little grasshoppers, particularly when they have like thousands and thousands of like cisco or perch, etc., that they could be feasting on. But I don't know, they must love their grasshoppers. And top water is an awesome way to capitalize on an ultra shallow water bite on both Sakakawea and Fort Peck. Um, Sakakawea, you can easily at times have 100 fish days on top water alone in July. It's unbelievable in like super, super skinny water. Fort Peck, I mean, crazy the big fish that are eating top water up shallow at times. Um, additionally, uh, I have to say like 
one of my absolute favorite bites ever is deep structure smallie fishing on both lakes. Uh, you know, I do a lot of it on Fort Peck, but Sakakwe, same gig. I love the deep structure smallie fishing, uh, you know, late July through till the freeze is over. Uh, there's a lot of techniques that work great. Um, one technique that is really old, I mean, just as old as time is a, is a tube for smallies. And it's an awesome, awesome technique. And there's a couple of reasons I really like it. This is a super versatile lure for a lot of reasons. Um, number one, you can cast this thing out and retrieve it back along the bottom like a lot of typical tube t t techniques. The other thing though, which I don't hear about very often, is you can cast this thing out and swim it back through the water column. So it helps you be really efficient in finding the fish, getting a pattern going. Um, if I had to pick one lure to fish, you know, probably for smallies period, it would be a tube. Um, super versatile lure, both dragging across the bottom or aggressively, you can like snap it off the bottom and trigger a reaction strike off bottom. And you can also swim it through the water column. If the fish are rising up off bottom a little bit, this is a great way to target them at different areas of the water column. Super awesome overlooked bait. I've caught giant, giant, giant fish on a simple tube. Um, my favorite head for this is a provider tube jig, and this happens to be a provider tube also. Um, the provider brand, you know, tube jig is a pretty unique head which works really well for both um, working it on the bottom and swimming it through the water column. So, um, finally here, I'm gonna touch on the legendary, seems like lately, Fort Peck Lake Trout. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but summer, through early fall, the water's hot. They have limited areas they can go, deep structure becomes a magnet for them. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, you can graph them fairly easy on sonar and down imaging. And if you use your electronics, you will find them. Um, I'd say one of the most important things to keep in mind with the lake trout fishing is to respect the fishery uh, and to be prepared with the right release tools a uh, good deep net so you can keep the fish in the water. Don't be banging the fish around the boat. Respect this fishery because it's a cool fishery <clears throat> and you can catch a lot of fish, let's, you know, for sure. So, uh, a very basic technique would be, you know, when you're in that deep water in midsummer, would be fishing on deep structure. Uh, and the biggest thing about fishing deep is you need something that can get down to the fish <laughs> in a reasonable amount of time without taking five minutes. So most of the time you're gonna be using two ounce, in my opinion, two ounce or heavier jigs just for the sake of efficiency. So this happens to be a two ounce Canlins, like a super something other jig. It's got like a six odd mustad. It's not as insane of a hook as, the problem is a lot of lead head jigs, once they get to be really heavy weights, tend to kind of come in like tarpon grade style hooks. It's a little excessive for a trout. I mean, these, these things are just big trout. Um, this Callens jig, uh, I'll have to, you know, maybe look it up and put it in the video, but this Callens jig in a two ounce, and this is a four and a half inch Lunker City shaker tail. Lunker City shaker tails work really well. This just imitates a basic Cisco. And uh, all you gotta do, graph the fish, get over them, drop down to them. Uh, something I like to do actually is honestly hold it above the fish and like kind of relatively still at times and the second a fish starts making a move up to your bait you just play keep away and they'll chase up and eat it. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can catch them out deep um, you know with different gliding baits, tube baits, darter heads etc. The problem is a lot of those just take so long to get to the bottom. Um, a lot of those baits would trigger fish just jigging in place where they like you know glides out to the side and they just pounce on it. Um, it's just not as efficient to get down there. So that's where a heavy jig and like a paddle tail or a grub can work really well. Also, I mean something like, this is a four ounce bucktail jig with a grub tail. Also, if they're a little bit weird, you can actually just take the grub tail right off and you can catch them on a straight bucktail, even retrieving it really quickly. Um, so anyways, that, uh, the Lakers, uh, apparently they tried stocking them in Sakakawea at one point, but I don't know, apparently it didn't take off. So yeah, the Lakers I'm referring to, it's all Fort Peck. Um, I've caught them from, I mean, honestly, like pretty much Fourchette all the way to the dam. Um, it's, uh, they're spread throughout the lake, 
However, when it comes to like targeting larger numbers of, you know, Lakers in the middle of the summer, big main lake structure in the deep cold water near the dam is going to be your go-to spot. Um, just remember, uh, no fishery is beyond, uh, you know, anglers influencing it. Um, and that goes for both Sakakawea and Fort Peck. Uh, both these fisheries, while they can be extremely tough at times, and you've got to put in a lot of work, and I, I can't underestimate that, it's a lot of work, it can be a lot of miles on your boat, um, it can be a lot of rough water, it can be a very trying situation many days. They can produce incredible, incredible, memorable fishing um, that's hard to beat anywhere in the world. However, uh, it's important to keep in mind, uh, particularly the size structure of fish can absolutely be influenced by angler harvest. Even on these large bodies of water with like somewhat minimal pressure per acre, um, and it's very important to, to respect that in the fishery. With any fish population, generally speaking, you're going to have more numbers of fish in shorter length ranges. As you move up, there's you know those big old fish. There are very few of them. It takes many, many, many years to grow big fish, particularly lake trout. But I don't care if it's smallmouth, walleye, pike, crappie, whatever. Just keep in mind. Big fish are a rare thing. Uh, they don't just get that way in two, three years. They can be older than your kid. I mean, they can be 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years old, and you know, particularly in the case of lake trout. Um, these fisheries are awesome, but it's very important to have the proper tools and to respect this fish and to be careful with them. Keep them wet, you know, get you know, in between pictures and stuff, give them a little dip in the water, give them a breather, get your picture, release the big ones, um, take home what you want to eat. Eating fish is great. I'd absolutely encourage that to bring home meals of fish, but keep, you know, those smaller to mid-sized fish, get pictures of those big ones, get a replica made, and have a blast. Um, like I said, both these fisheries, they can be, they can be very trying at times, um, but they are very awe-inspiring places, and like, it's, it's the kind of place, like, when you get that pattern dialed in and you just know what that, and then a little tingle runs down your spine, just like shaking, like with every cast, knowing what's about to happen. Um, it can be incredible fishing. I love, love both of these lakes and look forward to uh, my time out there this year. Um, so I hope that was a little bit helpful. Um, a lot of basics, uh, but, uh, you know, a few tips and tricks to get started. Um, like I said, I do offer some guide trips on Sakakui if you're interested in fast tracking the learning curve. Hopefully soon on Fort Peck. Um, fishing is something I'm passionate about, love, love doing, I love sharing about it, love educating. Um, when I'm in the boat, I, I go through every little aspect of like how to find the fish, why they're there, what they're doing, and how we can approach it. And like, you know, I, I love that aspect. Figuring out the bite is like where, where I get my kicks from. Um, it's such an exciting thing for me to do. And these uh, fisheries are so dynamic that incorporating how much the lakes change, how the bait fish influence populations, um, it's just a thrilling, exciting place for me to fish, and it's uh, not always easy, but I'm loving it. So, anyways, if you guys make it on out sometime, respect the fishery, have a blast, and good luck this season.